Chip Lear. Chip Lear. Wild Side. Welcome to the podcast. And if you're a fish head, this is the podcast for you. We sit down and talk to my good friend, Joel Nelson. And I don't care if you like to fish for panfish, trout, walleyes, muskies, whether you like to fish in January or June, Joel Nelson is your guy. And what's great about Joel is he is, he, he's not a tournament angler. Uh, you've seen him on TV, writes a lot of articles. And what the basis for all of his fishing knowledge is all science, because that's what he is. He went to school for natural resources, and that's the foundation of the knowledge that he shares with us today. He's gonna give us some tips and tricks on how to catch some mid-summer panfish, what to look for when we're chasing fish as we go into fall transition. It's a really insightful talk with my good friend, Joel Nelson. But before we do, please hit the subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast. Remember, we're here for you. We wanna know what you like, what you don't like, or maybe what you want to hear in the future. So never hesitate to reach out and let us know your thoughts. Until then, sit back, relax, and enjoy a great fishing chat with my good friend, Joel Nelson. Joel Nelson, welcome to the Wild Side. Glad to have you here. Um, and you know, Every time we get together, and I mentioned this just before we went live here, every, every time that we have had an opportunity to communicate, it just seems to flow. That's one of the reasons I wanted to get you on here. And so I'm, I'm all excited. I'm going to sit down. We're going to talk fishing with Joel Nelson. And I pop up your website today. And I, the quote on the front page is, the charm of fishing is that it is the pursuit of what is elusive but attainable a perpetual series of occasions for hope. Yeah, that's a, that's a deep one. Well, thanks for having me on, Chip. And I agree, every time we chat fishing, it's a, it's a pretty good conversation. But yeah, that quote, I, I like it because I, I try to be positive. i kind of a positive guy like yourself. And I think if you're an angler and you're not thinking positive, your fishing reflects it. So I, I love that quote because, yeah, I mean, we go out there and look to catch fish. We don't look to go out and get skunk, right? So, <laughs> but at the same time, that I'm looking at that quote, going, you know, that's probably pretty apropos for the times that we're living. <laughs> we could really use some perpetual series of occasions for hope. Right, right. No, I, yeah, and I. That's probably why you're seeing so many anglers on the water. I mean, I was just actually at a launch yesterday, and it wasn't just you know anglers. It was people tubing and pulling up on shore and having picnics and. I've never seen it so wild out on the lakes. I mean, people are definitely using the outdoors as an excuse to go out there. And like you said, an occasion for hope, right? So, so we, we did, we went through a little bit this in the, in the intro there, but you're, you're a man about it. And I, I love the fact that, I mean, you're an outdoor communicator, you're an educator, and you have found yourself with a foot in the door inside the fishing industry basically doing what all of us dream of. I mean, you go out, you participate in the sports, both fishing and hunting, mm -hmm. and then you just share your tips. You're not a tournament angler. You're not, right. you don't have a television program that you're, you're trying to promote on the side. Yep. You don't have this big secret hidden agenda of what you're trying to do. You're just a, you're just an outdoors guy sharing it. And that's, yeah. Yeah. That's a pretty I, cool niche to find yourself in, man. Uh, very lucky. It, it, it happened a little bit by chance and maybe there's some destiny to it. I don't know, but it was mostly, you know, I guess in the late 2000s or late nineties, early two thousands, I, I started doing some online blogging, uh, companies like Markham and strike master and a few others kind of took note and I started doing more writing and I learned really quickly that the things that I enjoy consuming from a fishing perspective are just, people sharing their experiences and I I have learned a ton from guys like yourself we fished together Chip um, I've learned stuff from guys like Tony Roach and other guides and people that just have a lot of experience so I feel like if they can share a few things with me that are super important in that regard why can't I do the same and I think I think a lot of people enjoy that part of it well I think that's part of what brings makes fishing community the outdoor community what it is whether it's fishing or hunting it's well, we, we share in the experience, right? We get to yep. go out there, we do, 
participate in the sport. We have there's cold days, hot days, windy days, right. calm days, all that. So you share in those experiences. But then we all want to know the little tips and tricks of what each other does to to bring success. Right. That's the first thing I ask, you know, I talk to guide buddies or I talked to you earlier this year. It's like, well, what, what are you doing, Chip, to get bit right now? You know, how are you going about it? And maybe I can share some of the things that I'm doing. And, and, and like you said, some days are hot, some days are cold. I, I try to keep it real because not everybody goes out, out there every time and slays, uh, myself included. And that's hard to own up to, but it's also, you know, it's realistic. It's what makes it real. Cause not everybody goes out there and just, uh, you know, puts it to the fish every single time. So here we are towards the tail end of, of summer, getting ready for fall. What's yeah. Joel Nelson fishing? What are you all doing? You know, it's interesting. Um, I was out last night. I was pulling for crappies, just uh, doing some jig trolling. I, I'm a big panfish angler. Um, probably panfish first, walleye second, but I love them both dearly. Uh, so I'm doing a lot of stuff right now because fish in my systems where I'm fishing are really scattered. They're here, they're there, there's weed fish, there's rock fish, there's deep fish, there's some fish up shallow. And just you look on the graph and a lot of the places you go, the fish are everywhere. So I'm doing a lot of trolling. Uh, for walleyes, it's more lead core stuff. For panfish, I'm trolling a lot of jigs. And I anticipate as water temps cool, those fish start to concentrate more. And so I'm excited to fish how I'm fishing now, but I'm also excited for the bites that are yet to come. So run me through, you're trolling for panfish. Yeah. Um, tell me exactly what, what that means. Yeah, no, it's a good question. I don't think a lot of people think about trolling as a technique for panfish, right? I mean, panfish, you're thinking bobbers, you're thinking end of the dock, or you're thinking, hey, I found some deep, I can just drop right below the boat and catch them. Um, I am learning more so over the past 10 years than previously that uh, panfish can be challenging where they're not concentrated or congregated in one spot. You know, there are a few here and a few there. And this time of year, crappies, especially, are off the weed lines in a lot of places I'm fishing. They're like over 30 feet of water. They're not relating to anything except for bugs and little bits and bites of zooplankton, the things that are coming up, and the minnow species that are feeding on them. So to catch those fish, I'm just taking long rods, seven foot rods or so, um, and I'm tying on different sizes of jigs. So it's great with a boat full of people, actually, because you can tie on a 64th, a 32nd, a 16th, maybe even an 8th, and various plastic combinations, and everybody pitches, just make a single cast behind the boat, um, let out a little more line, clip that bale over, and pull anywhere from 0.7 to 1.2 miles an hour. And some days it's faster, some days it's slower, but you stay consistent. So those jigs are covering different water column and let the fish tell you from there right so is it like a reactionary bite i mean you're just dragging through and yeah. hoping to go by a school and, and something something nabs at it that's that's exactly what it is and the cool part is is it's uh you know i work at the university of minnesota and i, I love science and uh, that's kind of my day job and so from a scientific perspective um it's like a big lab experiment you know what are the fish eating today it, it, are they at a certain level and depth? And that makes that 32nd ounce jig head the winner. And we all tie on 32nd ounce jig heads and now we're all catching fish. And then later in the evening, um, nobody's catching fish anymore on the 32nd ounce jig heads. We switched to a 64th ounce, the baits ride a little bit higher and now we're getting more fish. I, to me, it's, that's kind of the fascination is figuring out that bite. So I, I love fishing for crappies and I, I, you know, just like you're dialing in Great Lakes salmon or dialing in walleyes, lead core, open water. Uh, you can do the same thing with panfish and jigs. No, we, we brought up a, uh, a crappie photo there. A nice, that's a nice couple of photos here. That's obviously recently. That's not Yeah. Cool. Yep. Yep. That, you know, and that's something that you can do all summer. That was, uh, that was in June and those fish were a little more related to weed lines and edges. And then as summer has pushed on, those fish have kind of just started to wander out over the, over the open depths. And the funny thing is, is most of the anglers that are also fishing now, they're still in those June spots. They're still weed line. You know, they want something to relate to, but the fish aren't necessarily relating to that cover. They're kind of out in no man's land uh, eating whatever they can find. So how are we approaching like a, a, a panfish lake? And let's just take this for now. I mean, yeah. if we're on a panfish lake, how are you deciding? First of all, how do you pick, how do you pick the lake? And then when you, once you get there, how do you decide where to start? 
You know, uh, I do a lot of my fishing in two zones. Uh, Southern Minnesota, where I'm from, I'm and so there's a lot of great southern Minnesota lakes and a lot of those lakes that I'm looking for they do have good weed growth um, but that's not uncommon down here um, some decent rocks a little bit of wind just like a walleye you know they, they like that on those kinds of days but to pick the lake specifically I do a lot of looking at the DNR stocking reports and fishery surveys and so I like to pick my lakes based on what the DNR surveys are showing me and when it comes to northern Minnesota, um, same thing. And I fish a lot up there too. But for northern Minnesota, I really like the clearer bodies of water. Um, it, it relegates the bite to kind of a, an afternoon evening bite window so often in that clear water. But the fish can be bigger and they can really be out in the middle of nowhere over 50 feet, 30 feet. And man, if I've got some ice fishing experience with them, a lot of times, they're not too far from some of their winter haunts, which is kind of interesting. So, yeah. is, there a, is there a lake size we should be targeting, or, or I mean, because it a big water. I mean, it's yeah. intense. I mean, where the heck do you start? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, um, I fish a lot of lakes that I, you know, just like anyone, we're we're anglers. Uh, we we're creatures of habit, right? So if I ice fish it, I kind of know where those winter holes are. But chances are, if I ice fish it. I might fish it in the springtime. And if you know of a lake or two that has a great springtime crappie bite, you kind of know where they're spawning. I, I don't think that fish, and this is just a personal theory, I don't think they always move all that far. So if I know kind of they're in this shallow backwater bay, I look to the immediate good weeds just outside of that. And then from there, I just look towards the nearest open basin from that weed bed and I just start slowly pulling. And that's the cool part about trolling, right? You can cover water. So um, you don't have to say, this is my spot and pick it. And if you're wrong, you lose. Eventually, you're going to see something on the graph with side imaging these days, something off to the side that'll kind of cue you in. And sometimes I might see a pot of walleyes and I quit crappie fishing and I go after them <laughs> instead. But trolling is cool that way, right? You get to see a lot of water. So is there a lake, I mean, the lake size wise, should we... Yeah. Should we be, should I, should I limit it to like so many thousand acres or that, that's, that, that's, that's just, workable because it, yeah. I know for myself that yeah. anytime I go to new body water, especially if it's my first time there, yeah. I, if it's a few thousand acres, I'll mm -hmm. chew up time just driving around looking. Totally. It's, it's a great question. I, I like small lakes first. If I'm brand new to a lake, I'd rather be brand new to a small one than a great big one. Um, at the same time, when it comes to the bigger lakes, again, I apply that same logic of winter, spring, fall, people that you know that have caught them there before. Um, leech lake, you know, if I kind of know where a good spring bite has been over the years on leech, even anecdotally hearing from other anglers, I wouldn't be afraid to this summer go out into the offshore portions just immediately just immediately deeper than where they were in the spring and start doing some jig trolling because from my from what I have found a lot of times those fish can live within the same couple hundred acres or even smaller most of their lives they make small moves here and there so are the bandfish re uh, reacting to baits similar to to um, and I'm gonna use bass as an example. There's there's a, there's certain times that I want to use tube. There's certain times that I want to use some sort of grub. There's another time I want some sort of boot tail. Right. Do I want to mix all those things up, or is that you know what? If you're chasing crappies, just stick with the tube. You're gonna be just fine because they're they're crappies. These these are great questions because it really gets and you know I always vary my spread. So you talk to your Great Lakes trollers. They've got they got a couple things going on at once, right? They've got a really aggressive approach. They've got a moderate and then a finesse deal going on. And I think of tubes and sometimes even tubes or small plastic microplastics with a little bit like a waxworm tip. That's my finesse end of things. I'll have always have one rod to start with that. Medium moderate, I might go to a boot tail or a curly tail grub. Um, Northland makes that thumper jig with a little spinner on it. That's kind of a moderate approach. Um, and then I'll have like a number four rip and wrap or an ultralight crankbait on another rod. And it's amazing um, when the fish are on, you could catch them with the tube, but something that's louder 
uh, more aggressive, I feel it just it just excites the bite and calls them in, and then before you know it, we've all got ripping wraps on or something to that effect. So are you are you a, a light line guy or are you are you a beef it up and get panfish? I don't care guy. It's it's funny. Um, I spool up in the beginning every year. I've got six to eight panfish rods. I'd say two of them are kind of the micro light side of things. Most of them are not. Part of that is because in southern Minnesota, I don't have the water quality that really requires ultra light, super thin diameter lines. A um, couple reasons. I like to use seven foot kind of light, light extra fast rods, not ultra lights. And some of the lighter, even medium light rods more on the wall. They're almost like walleye rods, some of them. Little light line doesn't throw well or doesn't pair well with the larger size reels. It kind of, you're trying to balance out the whole thing, right? And so I don't need super light line. I fish six pound test a lot of times in the kind of the murky systems that I'm at. Um, and then if I need to go to four or like four uh, fluorocarbon when I'm up north on an ultra gin clear lake, um, I'll do that if I have to. But now for the most part, I'm not super light line. So this, you're basically talking about, you did a, um, one of those Lund experience, is that Lund experience? Is that what that's yeah. called? Yeah, Lund You did it with one of your sons, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That was a great, that was a great program. Well, one, you're introducing kids. Two, it was a, it's an open water midsummer. And I know that I'm, I'm, I've seen it. I think I found it uh, on your YouTube page. So, I mean, somebody just get to, get to your website, follow it to YouTube, yeah. get there and see yeah. it. It's a fun show. Yeah, and, and a little background on that show. So this is just the God's honest truth, right? Right. You you see that show and you see us catching fish. You and, don't always tell the truth. Is that why? No, you, right. That's exactly the God's what, honest truth. The producers don't always tell the truth. Right? <laughs> so so we were we fished for about a day and a half ahead of that on different log piles and areas that we knew of that we expected crappies to be, and we were going to drop on them and catch them. And, you know, uh, so goes the plans of, you know, mice and men didn't work out that way. Uh, at the end of it, we were thinking this isn't going to happen. We're scrambling. I'm sure you've been there. This isn't, might as well give up now. We don't even have time to shoot a show if we did. And sure enough, I started jig trolling because I thought, you know, this is how I fish back home. This is what I know how to do. If I see fish, I feel like I can catch them this way. And the show just unfolded in a matter of hours. Um, one here, one there, before you know it. Um, oh, great. Chad just brought it up on the screen. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You see Isaac right there. Now, he's vertical jigging at this point. So we tracked these fish down jig trolling. And then we, then we found a couple really great schools of them. And we were able to just drop straight down on them at that point and just catch them one after the other. So, you know, you don't always have to stay with the trolling. But just another prime example of, you know, do what you know. Um, it worked out for us when we weren't likely to get a show otherwise. It was a great, it was a great time. So you've been, you've been working for a number of years inside of the industry mm -hmm. and, and, and making a portion of your living doing just this and making shows just like this with your, yeah. with your son here. Yep. I mean, that's to me, I mean, that, that's one of the big misnomers that people have of fishing and outdoor. Oh, he looks thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. biggest misnomers that people have about fishing and fishing tele television is that all the adaptations or the adjustments that go that you finally go okay this is actually what the program is going we're going to set out to do this right but this didn't work so we don't actually even cover that then what didn't work we're just going straight to like this is what we were planning to do and we shoot it right and that's that's where the honesty portion comes in it gets pretty hard to fake a, a crappie show when either there's no crappies or you're not catching them the way that you said you would right you, you, being real in this industry as you know it's just it's so important and i think that was just a great example of uh you know right place right time it all ended up working out in the end and we showed what the story was that was exactly how it unfolded Right. Perfect. So to, to back up here just a little bit so people understand, and, and maybe I should have done this right away. I don't know. But um, you don't just come in as a guy that, that's really loves to, loves to hunt and fish. I mean, you went to school for biology, fisheries. Run yep. me, run me, give me a little bit of background on that so we, everybody sure. understands where you come from. Sure. You know, uh, growing up, I was the kid that was always down in the creek, seining minnows, trying to identify them. 
always had a strong interest in conservation. Um, I went to school for a four-year degree in natural resources. Fisheries was a big focus in that, um, but so was something called GIS, kind of a digital mapping side of things. Uh, I'm a huge map nerd, whether it's looking at the, you know, the, the GPS uh, contours in my boat graph, or whether I'm just staring at a hard paper map or a digital map on screen. I, I love that. And so then I went to Yellowstone National Park. I worked there doing GIS for a while, came back, got a master's in at U of M, and I continue to work at the U of M doing a lot of that stuff. And so, yeah, you're right. It's a lifelong passion and interest in conservation, natural resources, the outdoors that kind of led me into this whole thing that, that we're doing now. And when you say U, uh, U of M, you're talking about University of Minnesota. So yes. if anybody's listening, that's what we're talking about. And yep. you work there now yep. um, in mapping. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it, it's interesting. Now so that, we should yeah. be sending you all the pertinent fish info to apply <laughs> to the next series of University of Minnesota fish maps. Yeah, and it's funny. Um, I was just <laughs> going to say, fishing and mapping is a, such a small portion of it. I mean, Nowadays, we're mapping everything from soils to geology and oh. transportation lines and city sewer and the way water flows across the landscape. And so there's just a million applications. I would not have thought of that, but you're that's exactly right, because it, it yeah. all has to be traced or tracked, right? Absolutely. And, and geography or locations on the Earth's surface is like the common language amongst all these environmental variables and amongst all these things that we do. There's, there's always a spot on a map where this stuff's going down. So historically, how far back does your data go? I mean, do, do, can, we, can we go back a, a, a reasonable ways? Because I, I think about erosion and sure. I think about the, the formation and the, like I live on Leech Lake in Northern Minnesota. Mm -hmm. It was dammed, the water came up. I think about what was it like prior to the water coming up 10 feet, right? I'm just, sure. It had to look dramatically different. Oh yeah, you know, historical data sets are out there. Um, some of the earlier ones are the PLS, the Public Land Survey System in the 1860s for most of Minnesota, where they actually went out and at every quarter corner portion, you know, of the township uh, and the range areas, they would mark what they saw in terms of trees and just general information and what it looked like that. And from there, a pre-settlement vegetation map was created based on what Minnesota likely looked like back in the 1800s and, and beyond. A little more modern, there's actually air photos that exist in the 1920s, 30s, 40s. So they're flying this stuff with biplanes and black and white film driven cameras and it's interesting stuff. It's wild to see that stuff. So what kind of maps do you work on now? I mean, all, all of the above or is it, is it mostly natural resource related or what is it? Yeah, some of it's for the legislature. Some of what I do is actually training and helping other users understand this stuff better. You know, the University of Minnesota strong educational focus. Uh, one of the projects I'm working on right now is regarding tillage and erosion in Southern Minnesota where we're actually going out in the field and seeing at the time of planting with pictures exactly what the soil condition is like, how much uh, debris was left from previous cropping systems and matching that up to aerial imagery and projecting for the whole state what that looks like. And so where they're doing conservation tillage, where they're not doing conservation tillage and those kinds of things. So yeah, a lot of erosion and water quality work. There's Minnesota's full of water, so we do a lot of it here. So are you the kind of guy that I'd be completely jealous of the data they keep from one fishing trip to the next and that you've got little <laughs> SD cards with more waypoints and, and you actually write in the waypoints that this one's rock and this right, one's right. I you don't have to pull up on it and go, oh yeah, I don't know why I kept that one. No, I, I'm a little bit of both. I sometimes <laughs> impress myself, but most often really disappoint myself. Like you said, <laughs> I, I was trying to, it's it funny, I, I was trying to enter a waypoint last night because I went over a pot of fish and I saw them on side imaging like a hundred feet to the left and a big old pile of them. And I tried, and I, you know, cursor it over and I tried dropping a waypoint and it said, full. Full cannot no more waypoints allowed. You you have filled up the unit, and so yeah, I obviously need to do some cleanup. I'm just as guilty as the next person. <laughs> do you do you, uh, is everything you do electronic, or do you like physically journal as well? Uh, 
you know, I did a lot more journaling in the past. Um, it was an invaluable process for me to keep a logbook for a couple of years. Most of it in the mid 2000s, late 2000s, a lot of it ice fishing trips. Um, nowadays, most of my journaling is actually writing stories. You know, I write for Outdoor News. I write for my own blog. Um, and so a lot of that journaling turns into the story ideas and articles that I'm putting out that way. And um, I like both ways, but definitely journaling for turkey hunting. I'm a huge turkey hunting nerd and I keep a, every bird that we take detailed, detailed account where it was. I, I hand sketch a map. W what made all the differences? What did I screw up on? What could I do better? And that's how you get better, man. Whether you're fishing, hunting, well, I don't care. Life in general. That's, that's helped me a lot. Well, and with fishing, I know that you're not a, uh, you're not a tournament fisherman. That's never right. been, just never been your gig. Right. Um, but that's one of the things that we, you know, and I've, I've always, personally, I've always looked at tournament fishing as one of these little super hyper active uh, milliseconds in the world of fishing that you can learn an enormous amount because you've got a bunch of really good fishermen totally. trying to do exactly the same thing. Yep. And we come up with a, we come up with the magic answer, right? Somebody yeah. finds the secret sauce every sure. single day. Yep. And that's the hard part about fishing or hunting is trying to find that secret sauce every day. Yeah. And you're right. It's an accelerated form of learning and they're innovating out there out of a need to compete and do better than the next person. And so, yeah, you're right. So many of the advances we have in lure design and technique and new and interesting ways to catch pressured fish come from those tournaments. There's no doubt. So, and I know that in the past that you have been a very vocal um, and a, a, a very um, a large participant in some of the youth education uh, events that have taken place out there. Linder, lenders have a, I don't know what they call it, outdoor education or- Fishing careers workshop. Fishing yep. careers workshop, that was, that's it. Yep. So they, and you've been, a, you've been a speaker there and you talk to those anglers how many, when you, when you talk to, to the kids and we're sitting here in this strange 2020 pandemic year with participation numbers absolutely exploding. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, is it the competition? Is it the, are, are like when you go to these seminars and such, is it all about the competition? Is it all about trying to just want to spend time outdoors? Are there more Joel Nelsons? Or are there more Kevin Van Dams? It's interesting. I, you know, like you said, I, I, I've done a lot of those things and a lot of it is born from this idea of how do I make a living in the fishing industry? Say, I want to do this. I want to do some of the things you're doing. How do I do this? And, and I try to answer honestly, and I do run into a lot of youth that are so far ahead of where I was at that time. Um, they've got a plan. They've got a boat. They're out there fishing almost every day. Um, yet there's also a business side to it, like you know, and, and, and there's ways that I think that are a little more genuine of representing yourself. Is that aren't and, you know, a lot of people helped me in, in, when I was younger in the industry, and it's an easy way for me to try to give back because I yeah, I made every mistake under the sun when it came to, and I still do. I mean, nobody's perfect. And, and so the things that I could learn from other anglers that were willing to share that stuff with me about, you know, if you want to work in the industry, you want to work for some of these companies, here's a good way to represent yourself so you can represent them. Well, and I think, and part of the reason I bring this up is because here's a guy, here you are, right? And you're, you're a wonderful example of a person that has a, a, a sincere interest uh, in the sport. You've got a passion for the outdoors and you care about the environment uh, deeply, right? Yeah, Those things absolutely. are all really important to you. For you sure. also have a day gig, right? Yeah. You have a, and we yep. all, you know, there's so many illusions in the outdoor world that this is, this is, I just get up, I go fishing because I posted on Instagram today. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's not like Check that. In the mail for your Instagram posts? <laughs> it's not like that, as you know. Uh, and, and, it, and it's funny because I think a lot of people start into the industry hoping it can be like that. They experience what you and I know to be true, that it's not like that. And then they either get scared away and, and don't come back into it or just decide to do something different altogether. Um, 
whereas a sustained approach, something that builds over time, uh, you know, low and slow at first and, and eventually growing it, I think is a path to success in that regard. And so that, that's what I would recommend to anybody looking to start. What, I mean, is, is that the, is that the key, what are the keys to getting going towards that direction? Just that, just take it easy. I, you know, take it easy, understand your own limitations. A day gig is useful. Um, the, the biggest thing and I take this from John Marshall, a mutual friend of ours at, at Markham and does so many other things, uh, decide what to be and go be it. Um, if, if you're a great lakes angler that loves trolling for lake trout and salmon, make that your niche, your focus, and go be that person and share that information. I think too often uh, young anglers show up to the party and, and, and want to be showered, like you said, with the attention and the cash but they haven't really proven themselves in any regard. Um, they haven't done anything. They haven't proven any thought leadership or value to the company uh, that they would be seeking. It really has to happen in that order. You know, I, I had to write, I had to establish myself, I had to work really hard and, and, and share a lot of information, quality information and do a lot of TV and, and prove myself over the years until certain people were willing to listen the other way around show they give you the cash and say now go be great it doesn't it doesn't work like that <laughs> well i started taking you a lot more serious once i realized you went to school and graduated in natural resources <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're right you know but it's a fact it's like other guys i know in the industry if you've got yeah. a, a you know a, a science background and yep. you say something i pay a lot more attention i am not the scientist i'm not a biologist my mm -hmm. I fish much more from the, the heart and the gut and right. just in the trenches. Yep. I do not have, I've, I've got some, what I believe to be some fishing intuition, sure. but I don't have a well thought out scientific based thought process every time I hit the water. That's yeah, and you know what, Ex experience, time on the water tends to trump most else, but yeah, you're right. You know, having an education in the background it's always something that I recommend to a lot of these student anglers um, who want to hit the bass trail and sleep out of the back of their trucks. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. that you follow, but don't forget to lay down uh, a good base layer, uh, a cement, you know, foundation for your growth thereafter with a little bit of education. I, it's really benefited me where if now I wanted to go work full time in the fishing industry, I would probably have that option and that opportunity knowing I could fall back on other skills as well. But you're not taking that gig saying, I have to take this gig. You're, exactly. you're taking that because you wanted to take it. And there's a big difference. Huge. Options are key. And I, I, I think whenever somebody's kind of put in a corner like that, they're, they're not the best version of themselves. And when you can do what you love and, and do it from a, from a place of passion and, and genuine interest, you're always going to be more effective. So one of the things that we talked about here in the last, in the last uh, few days, you and I, was we, it, it, me in the middle of the summer, we went through a, it was really hot, water went through the absolute roof. And it was about yep. that same time that we released our article, Steve Quinn had written along with the, uh, uh, with some of the lenders and a few, some other input uh, from a number of people there. Mm -hmm. on aerotrauma right um and you you me almost immediately texted me like more people need to know <laughs> so from your with your science background tell me uh, first in case somebody didn't read that bring them up yeah. to speak on what it is and right. why we all need to know well uh, barotrauma is just a simple process of you know when fish are brought up from depth there's obviously a pressure change and certain fish can handle that pressure very well like salmon and lake trout um, they can come up quite a distance and it doesn't affect them. Uh, a walleye, panfish, bass, most freshwater species we chase after, as well as a ton of different saltwater species, can't handle being brought travels quickly and it basically ruptures their insides. They, you know, if you've caught a fish from depth and it was too deep, you can see sometimes they're, they have a distended stomach that's pushing out of their mouth, uh, their eyes can bulge. Uh, it's the process of that pressure or barotrauma hurting their body and it kills them. And 
my first experiences with that was actually deep jigging walleyes uh, on a lake where we were catching them in almost 50 feet of water in the fall. And you could release some of these fish and they seemed to be fine and swimming away. And you'd look over to the left a couple hundred yards and there were seagulls having a heyday with the dead fish that were floating up and picking them apart. And so I started looking into it a little more closely in my own neck of the woods here down by Cannon Falls. Red Wing is right next door and I know you fish pool for and the big dam there. And the DNR did a great study in the 80s, um, even late 70s into the 80s, where they were testing that were called a deep 60 feet of water all the way up to 15 feet of water. And then they released them in a pen later to see how long they survived. Um, what amount of them survived, you know, what were the mortality rates and what they found was basically for walleyes and saugers, 30 feet of water is kind of a magic number. You catch them in deeper than 28, 30 feet of water, you're starting to look at 70 to 80% mortality rates deeper than that. You catch them shallower and especially in cooler water temperatures, the success of the survival, you know, you're, you're talking about five to 15% mortality, which is part of hooking and just, you know, catching a fish, sometimes deep hooking them anyway. So um, it was a huge interest level to me to see your story on that and you running that and talking about that with other guests, because this time of year, especially fish are deep and anglers go after them. And I don't have a problem with that, provided they have a plan to keep those fish and they're, they're not all not in plot, you know, so we, we, we got to be careful of those things as anglers and self-police. So is this something that, that the, we should be, that there should be regulations? Should there be depth? I mean, because I, I, especially in the winter, um, yeah. I can think of a number of different fisheries that are loaded full of, of fish at, in deep water. Yes. And people pull them up through the ice. Well, you put them back down that ice hole and they swim away real quick. Yep. It doesn't yep. always work. So, I mean, we think we're being conservationalists, but maybe right. we're, we're not. So how do we, re what do we do? That's a great question. You, have, I, you and I have done enough filming where we're dropping underwater cameras. And sometimes we look in the areas we're fishing and other anglers have let a lot of these fish go and they're floated up against the bottom of the ice. You're dead, you're dead right. Um, and I don't know if regulations are the answer because it's kind of tough to regulate um, but educate first is always my, uh, my response to that. Again, I don't have a problem with eating fish. I, I love eating fish and keeping fish. But when you're trying to release fish from 28, 30 feet of water and below, because I found the same thing is true for sunnies and especially crappies, you're killing more than you're letting free. And again, if you're going to keep those fish and make a plan for that, fine. But when you've already caught your limit and you're still fishing and you're releasing all those fish, you're killing additional. You're going above your limit. And I think that needs to be stressed because uh, I see people do that quite often on a really good bite, especially a good crappie bite where you got to pin down in the winter. Um, those fish end up dying. Well, that puts guys like me in a real pickle because I, yeah. do, I don't keep I hardly ever keep any fish. I really sure. do. I mean, I, eat, I, I'm a, I love fish fries and I do a yep. few every year, but mm -hmm. I'm telling you 95% of what I catch goes right back in the lake. I, right. I really rarely keep them. And I get on a bite. I'm all, I might be short in some instances yep. and being done. I want to, I want the rod bent. I want to fight fish all day. Yeah. Well, what I've found is that most often with crappies in those basins, I mean, they can be 30 to 60 foot basins, right? And a lot of times those crappies are spread between 20 feet of water and 35 in a lot of the lakes that I fish, probably some of the lakes you do too. Um, you, you still focus on the top part of the school and have pretty good confidence that those fish have a good fighting chance, but you know it when they're dead and they come up. Like I said, their eyes are coming out, their stomach is distended. Um, whether you like to clean fish or keep fish or not, it's kind of your duty to keep those fish in my mind because it's doing no good to dump them right back. So do these release tools um, work? The ones that I, we made reference of them and Steve made yeah. a reference of them in his article. And if, if yeah. We'll have links to this in, uh, in some of the show notes and, and by, by all means get to the website. Uh, short versions, long versions, lots of information there, but do these release tools work? Yeah, you know, it's interesting you bring that up because Steve Quinn is, is brilliant. I've been a fan of his writing and just him as a person for years. 
Uh, and I'm really glad that you got him to talk about that. But yeah, those release tools, I actually own one of them and I don't know which model it is, but it was actually the one that was used on the West Coast. And so some research to that, uh, they used it in rockfish populations off the coast of California in Oregon and, and th those areas. And down to 90, 110, 150 feet, it works really well. And I've actually done it on Lake of the Woods walleyes. And while I have no way of knowing whether those fish survived after I released them, what I can tell you is fish that I've caught in that flirting with 30 foot mark. I, again, I try to stay away from fishing them deeper than that because I just, I feel very strongly that you're just harming them. Um, in that 25 to 30 foot of water, I use this tool. It's just an interesting thing. It hooks kind of onto their mouth and it's a big weight and it basically is reverse barbed. So it sends the fish straight down like a rocket. And then you set the hook on a little mini ice fishing pole and it pops that hook out of their jaw and they're down there. It basically is like a, a reverse fish elevator that takes them all the way down to the bottom floor and drops them off to where they were. And hopefully they reach equilibrium and you fought them quickly, took a quick picture and released them well. And yeah, I mean, I know it's been proven to work in a lot of those saltwater species. I've not seen a study on how well it works for, for walleye specifically, but Hey, I'm willing to give it a try. So they have a protruding air bladder coming out of their mouth. Is it, I mean, will that actually retreat and be okay? Because it doesn't look good, Joel. I'm telling you. <laughs> no, I, when, they're, when they have experienced that amount of barotrauma, I'm not sure that that will retreat. Yeah. I'm not sure. And, you know, ish I don't know what that is. Um, it's a long practice that's been done in certain deep water environments where they'll take a hypodermic needle and they'll push it into a certain portion of the fish's anatomy and try and release pressure on that air bladder inside of them that's that's blowing up. The the only problem from the research that I've seen that happens is is that a lot of times anglers just don't know the anatomy of a fish well enough to hit it. They can heart stab it, lung stab it, put it through the spine, hit the bloodline that runs right below the spine. And most anglers do more harm than good fizzing fish. That's always been my take. It's the take of a lot of fisheries biologist friends that I have. So uh, I think these new tools have a lot more promise to work. Uh, maybe not sure about the distended stomach part or the bulging eyes, but uh, certainly more so than fizzing would, in my opinion. So with your, with your uh, science background here, we're going to switch seasons. We're going yeah. to transition from summer to fall. Sure. Where are the fish moving next? Because the one thing that we all want to know is if I go out there tomorrow and they're not there, is, yeah. these, is these air temperatures start to drop, so does the water temp. Yep. yep. When do these fish kick it into gear and when do I start looking at the next spot and what is the next spot? Sure. Um, Without diving too far into lake limnology, you're aware of turnover, fall turnover. It's a period where the water temps get cold enough and eventually the lake flips. Um, and all of the warm water that was in one place up above flips with the cold and evenly mixes throughout the system. So you don't get a big dichotomous temperature from top to bottom. Instead, fall turnover means the water is mixed well. Once that happens, and it's anywhere from late September, if we get cold weather early in a lot of lakes in Minnesota, as late as mid-October or late October in some of the southern lakes here, if there was, if, if there was a, a good structure, a thermocline that's set up. Um, and once that happens, bait fish can be anywhere. And the same with the walleyes that like to chase them, right? So on the Mississippi River, uh, Lake Pepin, where I fish a lot in the fall, uh, it means those shad are shallow up against rock. And one of the best things that I like to do is after turnover, and you don't know exactly when this is, right? So when water temps are in that 50, I'd say high 50s to low 50s is when it starts for me. You get a big wind on some of those rocks. I expect to be bait up against them. I expect the wind to crash that bait and create lots of feeding opportunities for walleyes. And so I, I live for big windy days in the fall to throw crankbaits and I, yeah, I just, I've got a, you know, I've got a rod here with a crankbait rigged up and this thing will stay tied on and ready to huck as soon as the big winds of the fall come. And that, that's what I look for, man. A, a big wind really to get out and do fall fishing. So, and you'll do more casting versus trolling? Why? Yeah, you know, um, I feel that with casting, 
uh, I can actually cover more water in the small spots that we're at. You know, trolling, let's say you've got a 100 yard stretch of rock rubble shoreline. And I can troll up and down that thing, but as the fish get shallow, maybe not so much in the Mississippi because of how murky it is, but especially in clear water, you don't wanna be driving over those fish, right? They'd be right below the boat. They might spook. Maybe you could pull planer boards up against them. But I feel like if I know they're in this 100 yard stretch, I can literally pick this thing apart. And as I'm casting, I'm mapping, right? Just like most good anglers. Of course you are, that's what you do, you're a mapper. <laughs> um, I'm, this one I'm mapping in my mind, right? It's not on paper or on digital, but yeah, good point. Um, I, I'm casting and I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to hit shore near it. And then I'm taking two or three cranks and did I touch? Did I hit a rock? Did I hit a boulder in sand? And did the crankbait just go dead? Did I hit a little patch of vegetation? Um, and I'm trying to figure out the portions of that rocky shoreline that are holding fish. And then why? What did I bounce off of? What am I feeling with the bait and the crankbait that's telling me why these fish are here? And once you unlock those secrets, well, now we just look for more windy shorelines with a, a good patch of weeds up against them, you know, for, for example. Well, it's hard to it's hard to narrow it down to a, a, a certain spot. I mean, are you, 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 are you fishing these things fairly fast and just trying to cover water till you, till you make contact or how do you, how do you decide how to do that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, you start with the obvious ones, like the big windy points, right? A lot of those points are going to have exposed rock anyways, or they'll have sand on one side and, you know, on the backside and rock on the other. Um, a lot of them too in the river, they're getting maybe a little bit of current, depending if we've had some rains. Um, and, and you've also got feeder creeks. So those are other hot areas, especially if there's any rock or artificial kind of man-made rock walls up against them. Um, so those are hot spots to start with. And then from there, yeah, you're dead right. I mean, you're throwing that crankbait as fast as you can. It looks like Bassmaster Elite style hucking, not, not, not careful walleye hucking, right? <laughs> so the one, the one decision that is, that seems to perplex a lot of us fishing and I mean I'm interested to know how you do this but is there is a there's a there's a time and a place that you want to incite a reactionary bite and then there's a time and a place that you want to entice a bite so whether I'm trying to get a, a, a speed by them and get the fish to react to it quickly or I got to lay a piece of, of, of live bait in front of them and wait for them to bite and this could be panfish this could be uh, uh it could be heck be must it could be nice yeah. how do you make that decision on any one given day that's a it's a great question and i guess uh you know as you were talking i kind of had to think about that you know i think i think sometimes we just do what we do because we're used to doing it maybe we've experienced some success that way but i guess if i dig deep into the why uh when i'm in a bite window let's say it's early morning or late morning, or I've got a good wind that's really pushing hard into a shoreline and has been riling it up for, especially up to two or three days. Or, you know, I've got a situation where there's an, you know, oncoming storm and I feel like the weather is exciting the bite. I'm almost 100% reaction strike fishing. I am fishing fast. I'm typically fishing with hard baits. Um, it can be trolling, most often it's casting. Uh, if it's pan fish, I uh, will get more and moving over, get reaction strikes. Now, if it's more dog days fishing, let's say clear bluebird skies, I'm deep water fishing. I can see them on the graph. They're all piled up. Then I start more with trying to entice the bite. Like you were saying, maybe with live bait and really dangle it in their face, slip bobbers, vertical jigging. But as you know, from the guys on tour, well, sometimes all the enticing in the world still doesn't work. And, and then, well, maybe it's time for a zig when you would normally think zag. If I can see fish on the graph and enticing isn't working, I was just up to Crane Lake over the, yeah, over this weekend. And we were on such a big school of walleyes and we had a storm come and blow us off, which is too bad because we just found them 10 minutes before the storm and the enticement wasn't working. My next step, I was going to bomb them with a puppet minnow or something. I mean, just drop something big and crazy on their heads and see if you can't get them type strike. So 
Yeah, that's kind of my process. That's my philosophy going into it that's worked for me in the past. So another random question here, but from a from a lure standpoint, right? I mean, I everybody always seems to, and, and tackle companies are as guilty of it as anybody. They want, they market everything that this is going to be the magic answer. You buy this bait, suddenly all you got to do is put it in the water, fish yeah. swim to the lure from the other side of the lake. Sure. And I'm, I'm exaggerating, of course. Right. But why does it, it really does seem to evolve. Yeah. Old baits seem to, their effectiveness seems to wear on. And then mm -hmm. this new stuff comes out and there is, there's wonderful innovation. Some of it is in technique and some of it is actually is in product. Yep. A lot of it is in the, the color and paint job, which might somewhat be for us. Yep. It, why, is it, in your opinion, is there, do you, do you see the same thing and how do we how do you keep up with i you know i see a lot of old things become new again um i'm i wouldn't consider myself old but old enough to i guess as a kid look in magazines you're laughing stop laughing <laughs> <laughs> to look at magazines when i was a kid and talking about jigging rat fishing or 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 fishing spoons deep and that was the new innovative thing and then it went silent for two decades maybe three decades and then some guy wins a tournament on it you know here a year ago and all of a sudden boom now now we're doing this again and so you see a lot of those things recycled i'm sure you've seen a ton of that recycled in your career but the cool part about that is that also spawns innovation because it's like well but now we're fishing more with braid and, and now, you know, with zebra mussels, a lot of the big Great Lakes systems and other lakes that we're fishing, they're clearer. So maybe we take that old technique and we adapt it to braided line in clearer water with better paint jobs and a little different glide to the bait, perhaps. And so that's, I see a lot of old things become new again, but also because of the times have to be adapted and innovated slightly to, to fit current day. So as I'm going forward and I'm fishing, how do you how do you structure your day? What am I uh, what do I most need to or or what do us as fishermen need to pay the most attention to? Do we need to pay attention to the calendar year? Do we should be paying more attention to this presentation like we're talking about right now? Should we be paying more attention to the wind and the rocks and those shad blowing up against that rock like you talked yeah. about there? Yep. Or should I be paying attention to whatever the coolest, latest, greatest gadget is I bought at Bass Pro Shops, because <laughs> that's what I'm going to force the fish to bite that. Right. Um, it's a great question. And again, you've, you've kind of given me, uh, you know, reason to pause for thought. I recently, you know, having kids and fishing so much with them and my kids as friends and sometimes with my wife and her friends, I, it's been hard for me to do because I do fish seriously when I can, but over the past five years, I'm fishing less and less seriously. And I, I mean that only slightly in jest. I mean that I'm guiding them in some respects. And, and then I think, well, the most important thing is to be, what's your goal for the day? What are we trying to do here? Are we trying to knock it out of the park and we're only after eight pound walleyes and I don't care if I only get three bites, they better be the big three. No, that's not the game. And maybe we don't fish for walleyes at all. Maybe we fish for what the opportunity is. This summer, I was pulling um, butterfly blades with crawlers for sheephead. I was trying to catch a lot of anglers would be like, what in the world would you try to catch one of those things for? Well, I just wanted to put a bend in my rod for my, my, my son and his two buddies that were with. So we had a great time and caught a ton of them. And that was exciting for them. We did that for two hours and then that was the end of the day. So we couldn't really focus on what was the weather like, what was the calendar period, what, you know, it, I'm really trying and I'm not great at it, but I'm trying to say, what is the goal for today? What, what, what's a win for today? And then pattern my fishing off of that. Well, it sounds like you're still having, you're, you're having, I shouldn't say still, you're having fun fishing. I mean, you still get up and, and can't wait to get in the boat and have, Yes. Makes fun. Have you, has that ever not been there? You know, sometimes I'll be honest in the industry, I'm sure you've experienced it too, where uh, fishing becomes part of a chore or your daily bit that you have to get this done or create this deliverable. But then you have 
step back and say, well, those are really the only times when I'm too busy to fish with family and friends that I can't enjoy it for myself or for them. I got to get a lot of things done, but I've been really trying lately to say, Hey, um, any day on the water is a learning experience. Uh, I learn all, every single time I'm out there, I learn something and it may be just to reinforce what I felt like I already knew other times something happens and it totally challenges what I used to think. And I'm like, boy, if I hadn't fished today, I don't think I'd ever picked up on that deal. So, so yeah, I, um, I am fishing a lot. Yeah. There's a big sheep. <laughs> How do you not love that? <laughs> that thing fought like two 10 pound walleyes. I can tell you that that thing turned sideways in the current. It's like an ocean sunfish or some darn thing. <laughs> well, there was just a, a walleye tournament here. Um, I think it was like, like the aim championship series here this past weekend. I'm not, I'm not kidding. You. And I, I look at your, your son there holding up that fish. Amongst the middle of all this tournament in the hoopla, Keith Cabayas, Hall of Fame angler, has got a post on one of his social media sites, him holding up a giant one because he had a great time catching it. Yeah, it doesn't make a difference. You're a Hall of Fame angler or you're Joel Nelson's son. They're fun to catch. I, I have heard, and I you, you'll have to ask the guys on tour to confirm this, but I've heard that there have been side bets in the past on the Mississippi River for biggest sheepy. Um, yeah. <laughs> I know that to be a fact. Yes, that does. There are, there's a numerous side bets, catfish bets, sheep yep. bets. Oh, oh yeah. That's, and that to me gets back to the fun of fishing and specifically multi-species. I mean, I, uh, I love panfish. I love walleyes, but you know what, if they're not cooperating, let's fish for something that bites. I'm not too proud. I, heck, I, I just love fishing. So why not? Right. Joel, I love having you on. I love uh, conversing with you. I'm going to include their, uh, make sure we get links to Joel Nelson Outdoors, your, your webpage, and all your social media links on the, uh, the information that goes along with this podcast. It's been, it's been great to have, have you on here. Did I, is, is, do we have anything coming up that we need to, like, hey, if you're out and about, uh, make sure you stop and see Joel here or anything coming up? You know, nothing on the books yet. We'll see what ice season brings because of COVID. But at the same time, you know, we're always doing something online. Uh, check out the social media deal, uh, joelnelsonoutdoors.com. Um, yeah, I've got a lot of fall content coming out just in terms of what I'll be doing next. And might involve some hunting, definitely some fishing. But uh, as you know, ice season seems to start earlier every year, even when there's not ice. So we're already talking ice if that's what you're into. Um, I love it and never hesitate to reach out to me. Um, I've got my information, on my website to send me an email and I just, I love conversing with anglers when I can, whether it's at a show or through the web stuff. Running into you again and hopefully we can hop in the, in the boat again soon. That sounds awesome. Thanks for having me, Chip. Thank you. I could sit and talk to Joel Nelson for hours and I, I, it's obvious the man is just super knowledgeable on all species of fish, no matter what the time of year and, and his passion certainly bleeds through. I strongly encourage you to get to his social media pages and of course, Joel Nelson Outdoors and follow him in your coming uh, months and weeks because you're gonna become a better angler through the information that Joel provides. Until then, hit the subscribe button. It's right here, right now. And join us so you never miss an episode of Chip Lear's Wild Side Podcast.